I'm Dr. Richard Smith. I've always been fascinated by the underdogs of the ocean. It's these creatures I'm dedicated to learning more about and sharing with the world. If you asked people to name some coral reef animals, you'd hear turtles, sharks, rays, maybe anemone fish, but few of the little animals that make reefs their home. I guess it's not surprising, since so many are still being discovered. These smaller animals, about which we know very little, contribute a huge number of species to the overall biodiversity of the reef. It's almost impossible to conserve an organism you know nothing about. I first became aware of pygmy seahorses in the late 90s, but it wasn't until 2002 that I actually saw one. I was diving off the island of Komodo in Indonesia and went down to 30 meters. I just had a fleeting glimpse, but it went on to change my life. At that time, there was only one named species. Now there are eight. The most recent two of these I named together with colleagues from the International Seahorse and Pipefish Specialist Group. I conducted the first research on the biology of pygmy seahorses and made surprising discoveries about their lives on a miniature scale. Diving for me was always about getting to know the animals. Identifying from memory the various sea slugs I was finding made me realise underwater photography could be a useful tool in documenting all the necessary detail. This early training in photographing small animals ended up being vital in my pygmy seahorse research, which would have been impossible without collecting technically challenging close-up images. Coral reefs are an ecosystem comprising many thousands of species. Each has its place, playing a specific role. Some are foundational, like reef-building corals. Others, as far as our current understanding goes, might simply be contributing to the complex web of life. Each of these parts is interconnected and together form a resilient ecosystem. When parts are removed through processes such as climate change-induced coral bleaching, overfishing, or disease, the structure becomes fragile and liable to collapse. Every species has its place on the reef. While some are not fussy, others are specialist and picky about exactly where they live. Anemone fishes have become the reef's celebrities. You may not have thought about it, but anemone fish are a great example of a habitat specialist. They happily dart in and out of the anemone's stinging tentacles. They're immune to the stinging cells, thanks to a protective mucus tailored to their specific home. The anemone provides the fish a safe haven from its predators. Meanwhile, the anemone benefits from this relationship through fertilizer derived from the fish's waste. The fish is also rather plucky and will chase off any other creatures that might be tempted to make a meal of the tentacles. Anemone fishes are just one example of the many habitat specialists on coral reefs. Relationships in which both parties benefit are known as mutualistic. In other cases, 
Like porcelain crabs, which also share anemones, the crab benefits while the anemone simply plays host. This is known as commensalism. Putting all your eggs in one basket and living with only one other species has its pros and cons. Anemones are prone to bleaching, just like corals. If this happens, the fish are less healthy and have fewer young. If the anemone becomes so stressed that it dies, the anemone fish will almost certainly follow suit. These kinds of species can be like a canary in a coal mine. As they start to vanish, it's a sign of worse to come. Other commensal species include hairy squat lobsters that live in small pockets of huge barrel sponges, orangutan crabs that live on bubble corals, and shrimps that scurry up and down long whip corals. The reef is bustling with creatures like these. We're here in Indonesia at the heart of the Coral Triangle. This area has the world's highest marine biodiversity. Literally, the further you travel from here, the fewer species you'll find. The Wakatobi Archipelago is off the remote southeast corner of Sulawesi, Indonesia, where small but growing communities dot the islands. I first visited the area in the late 90s whilst working on a marine conservation project. Before the resort built an airstrip, it took several days by plane, ferry and road to get here. The small groups that visit the dive resort help to fund a private no-take zone that covers 20 kilometres of reef and all the amazing diversity within. This is a well-trodden path for me, but I'm excited to be back at the Wakatobi Dive Resort house reef. I spent hundreds of hours studying the social lives of pygmy seahorses, just over the drop-off. The first pygmy seahorse was discovered quite by accident in 1969. A researcher in New Caledonia brought up a Gorgonian coral for the museum. When he looked closely at its surface, he spotted a pair of tiny seahorses clinging to its delicate branches. Pygmies are some of the smallest seahorses and some of the smallest of all fishes. They measure between 14 and 27 millimetres. Out of the eight known species, the Bargibants and Denise's pygmy seahorses that I study are the only ones found exclusively on the surface of Gorgonian corals. Gorgonian corals are like the redwoods of the reef, living for many decades and possibly over a century. There are many different kinds of Gorgonians, but pygmies are particular about which they live on. The fact that so little was known about pygmy seahorses inspired both my research and my ongoing fascination. The first thing I wanted to do was get a clearer idea of how rare or common pygmies are. This was arduous and painstaking work, spread over many months. In the end, I surveyed all Gorgonians in an area equivalent to a soccer field and found them to have the smallest populations of any seahorse. Given how laborious these surveys were, I wanted to investigate ways of making them easier.
certain organisms can be highlighted when illuminated by ultraviolet light. UV fluorescence was first discovered in corals, but has since been found in a wide variety of marine creatures. Pygmies have also been suggested to glow under these lights, whilst their Gorgonian home doesn't. This has the potential to make surveys quicker and more productive. Heading to a Gorgonian we knew had pygmies, I photographed many fluorescing creatures along the way. Scrutinising the Gorgonian surface, my hopes were dashed finding only tiny patches of fluorescence on the tails of some pygmies. Frustratingly, it doesn't seem like this will be a useful tool in population studies. I also studied how pygmies use the various spaces around their home Gorgonian surface. I tracked their movements, recording their locations each time I visited, several times a day over many months. This built up a picture of their home ranges. I found one female had a home range the size of an open magazine, whilst one of the males lived out its whole life in an area equivalent to three playing cards. Like other seahorses, pygmies share the reproductive quirk of true male pregnancy. A female transfers a clutch of unfertilised eggs into the male's empty pouch. The pouch is then sealed until the babies are born. For those seahorses that have been the subject of research, all have been found to be monogamous, at least for each brood. This means that neither male nor female remate for the whole time the male is pregnant. I'd made an interesting observation on my many sightings of pygmy seahorses. Often they live in groups with three or five individuals. Knowing that all seahorses are monogamous, I wondered what the third or fifth wheel might think about this. So I decided to investigate further. There are few places you can dive off a jetty into such a species-rich community, let alone one that's home to pygmy seahorses. Meet Tom, Dick, Harry and Josephine. This male heavy quartet was the perfect group to help me reveal the private lives of pygmy seahorses. Initially, to determine Tom, Dick, Harry and Josephine's sexes, I took a close-up macro image underneath their bellies. This is where my photography came in vital. Here you can see Josephine has a tiny raised circular paw, and Tom has a slit-like opening. The three males like to show off their dominance, so I saw a lot of infighting, like trying to strangle each other with their tails. The toils of pregnancy also apply to male pygmy seahorses. Firstly, they might be the only males in the animal kingdom that suffer stretch marks after giving birth. Secondly, within only 20 minutes of giving birth, the male is expected to receive another clutch. This was the first time the complete reproductive cycle of these tiny animals was recorded. Learning all this made me really appreciate the complex social lives of such diminutive animals. While my research gave us the first window into the lives of pygmy seahorses, we still have much to learn. Their reliance on Gorgonian corals, and their rarity, puts them in a precarious position. This tenuous situation was highlighted in the Mediterranean, when a species of Gorgonian was almost wiped out by a virus linked to warming waters. If this happened to the Gorgonians on which pygmies rely, they could be lost forever. Pygmy seahorses are just one of the thousands of habitat specialists adding to the outstanding biodiversity of coral reefs. Each has their own story to tell. 
The reefs of Wakatobi don't appear to have changed in the 10 years since I was last here. But we can't be complacent. Elsewhere around the world, on the Great Barrier Reef, Hawaii, Maldives and the Caribbean, coral reefs are disappearing. Coral bleaching, pollution, overfishing and disease are just some of the many causes of decline. I've spent my career exploring the oceans of the world and I see the changes. Coral bleaching is having the gravest impact and reefs are fundamentally changing before our eyes. We just don't know enough about most animals to know how they will endure. We all must shoulder the responsibility to reduce our footprint to begin the change required to keep reefs on this planet beyond 2050.